Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Kevin Ballin. I'm a senior at the college studying sociology, and I currently serve as the vice president of the Institute of Politics. October is LGBTQ History Month, a time for us to celebrate the accomplishments of LGBTQ people and to honor the history, struggle, and perseverance of this community. As a member of the LGBT community, I'm able to walk around in pride and not in fear because of trailblazers who have come before me, often putting their lives on safety on the line. It's especially important during this month that we honor LGBT people and particularly trans people in political power, not just for representation's sake, but to be a needed voice and advocate at the table. With that said, it's my absolute honor to introduce Dr. Rachel Levine, Assistant Secretary for Health, for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the first openly trans person to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Joining Dr. Levine to moderate our conversation is the fantastic Dr. Marcella Alshon, Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And with that, I'll turn it over to our guests. Thank you so much, Kevin, and thank you so much, Dr. Levine, for being here. It's an incredible honor. Uh, we're so excited, and um, there's a lot to cover, so I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, Social determinants of health are increasingly discussed as a key driver of health disparities highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you address what HHS is doing to try and, um, try and address some of these social determinants and is the department working with other parts of the federal government? And, and lastly, what can we as researchers and students be doing to ensure more equity in health outcomes? Well, uh, good evening, and it's a really a pleasure and an honor to come back to Harvard and to, and to be here. Um, and thank you for that question. So, you know, the social determinants of health are, are critical to the policies that we develop at the Department of Health and Human Services, and that we, we use as we collaborate with other uh, departments in the Biden-Harris administration. Um, achieving health requires more than just controlling disease. We need to work to produce and assure conditions in which people can be healthy. And that includes in their social and physical environment. So as we look at many different social phenomena, uh, to me, they are health issues. So when I think of economic opportunity and a living minimum wage, to me, that is, a, a, you know, in, in, in public health, that's a health issue. Uh, ec um, the, uh, the ability to have uh, uh, you know, an education, that is a health issue. Um, housing is a health issue. The environment is a health issue. Transportation and working with Secretary Pete, that's a health issue. Uh, nutrition, of course. Um, all of those things, um, we, we tend to think of health in all policies, and all of these things actually determine people's health. And what we have clearly seen during the COVID-19 pandemic is the depth of the health disparities that exist in our country. So uh, working with the social determinants of health and working for health equity is a priority of Secretary Becerra of the Department of Health and Human Services and a priority uh, for the administration. Um, in regards to COVID-19, uh, I'm very pleased to have a seat on the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. I have an ex officio um, seat on that task force, which by the end of this month will be providing its specific recommendations uh, to the president uh, in terms of dealing with these health disparities as, it re as they relate to COVID-19. The secretary has also restarted a health disparities um, council Mm -hmm. And I co-chair that council, uh, looking across HHS and all of the different divisions um, and looking at, uh, at health equity and where health equity can be promoted within my office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, but also um, uh, within CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the CDC, the NIH, uh, the FDA, um, HRSA, the Health Resources Service Association. I mean, whatever division you're looking at, we are working to promote um, to promote health equity and to deal with these issues of the social determinants of health. One program that's run out of my office that deals with this is actually the Healthy People Program. So you've probably heard of Healthy People. There's, you know, the Healthy People 2020, which, uh, um, and now we have just come out uh, with Healthy People 2030. And that really draws attention to, to health equity, health disparities, health literacy, and to focus on these priorities. Um, the definition of the social determinants in Healthy People 2030 
are the conditions and environments in which people are, are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning in the quality of life and outcomes. And so, you know, th this really is uh, the, the, the structure, the framework by which we're looking at, at public health now um, and in the future. That's terrific. And it's so nice to have a concrete definition. I, I myself will, will be looking that up in the future because I think um, it's been a, a constant struggle for researchers to kind of actually concretize that. So it's wonderful that 2030 has put that, Healthy People 2030 has put that definition in there. And, and just for our audience as a quick follow-up, could, um, could you define health literacy and what that means and, and what the department is specifically um, doing to tackle that? Sure. So, you know, we are working in, in, in terms of health literacy about, about people's understanding um, of these social determinants of health, their understanding of what, um, of what impact all of these social phenomena have upon their health, and then also being able to, um, to get the right recommendations and to be able to, to, to make, um, you know, individual choices about how, about what, what will impact their health and those choices that they want to make. But, you know, you have to have those choices. And unfortunately, in too many areas of our country, you know, the, for example, there might be food deserts. There might be areas that, uh, uh, that really do not, people might want to make more healthy choices about their food, but they don't have access to places to buy healthy food or they can't afford those choices. Now you might think of food deserts as occurring, you know, in rural areas, for example, where you know if you're in, um, you know, uh, rural parts of the country. And you know, I was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania before I took this position, and Pennsylvania is quite a rural rural state. And you know, areas in, in uh, northern Pennsylvania, northwestern Pennsylvania, that maybe didn't have access to to grocery stores that would have uh, that have fruits and vegetables and you know things like that. But there are actually a lot of food deserts in urban areas as well, where the only food might be a convenience store where, um, or fast food. And that really is the only easily accessible and affordable food choice. So you can have food deserts in, in all sorts of different environments. And so it, you have to be able to create those conditions where, where you educate people about making, uh, through health literacy, the right type of choices, for example, about their nutrition. Uh, but then they actually have the conditions where they can put that into action and they can, they have affordable and accessible um, uh, 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 places to buy healthy right. food and healthy food and food. And so that's exactly what we mean about social determinants of health, uh, mm -hmm. where these other social factors in, impact people's health. And we have to work on that in addition to what we traditionally think of as the, our medical system, which is, pre which is preventing and treating specific diseases. This is a health focus. And that's the, that's the basis for Healthy People 2030. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, now, obviously, we're still trying to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are other health challenges in the background as well. Um, one of which you've worked on for years now um, in, in Pennsylvania, which is the opiate crisis. And you were pioneering in your making naloxone widely available and saving thousands of lives that way. Um, but it's still ongoing. It's, it's hitting particular, some communities particularly hard. Can you talk about what has been done and what you would like to be see, seen done from a policy perspective to address the opioid epidemic? Well, thank you for that question. That is an issue that I worked, as you said, extensively on in Pennsylvania and continue to work on in, in my new role as the Assistant Secretary for Health. Um, you know, the, the overdose epidemic is worse than it ever was. Um, in, in the last 12 months, more than 95,000 people died of drug overdose deaths. That's the highest number ever recorded in a 12 month period. And so overdose deaths have accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the vast majority of overdose deaths are, are due to opioids, but there are um, other, other drugs involved as well. Uh, we're seeing um, more mixed overdoses. Um, including stimulants such as uh, methamphetamine and cocaine. And then, you know, many of the overdoses, the majority of doses are, are involved with synthetic fentanyl compounds that might be, uh, you know, um, uh, adulterating others. So you might be thinking you're taking methamphetamine, but actually what you're getting is the methamphetamine and fentanyl, 
Uh, you might be thinking you're getting um, marijuana, but you're getting marijuana that has fentanyl in it. So, um, and, and fentanyl, as you know, can, can be hundreds of times more powerful than, than morphine or even heroin in terms of its risk for overdose. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is part of, the, of many of the different um, mental health issues that we're seeing um, increase during the pandemic. And it's just of, of it's the crisis within the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic. Um, so we are taking a whole of government approach, um, you know, across the Department of Health and Human Services, but other departments as well, um, as we address this. One is by looking at the social determinants of health, which yeah. will impact, um, you know, uh, uh, people's mindset and, and their mental health. You know, uh, we, we, tend to, we tend to look at many of these things like overdoses as diseases of despair. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. we have seen more despair, more loneliness and isolation during COVID-19, which has been one precipitating factor. So in terms of, uh, of how we're approaching it, we want to approach it with four domains. Um, the, the first is prevention. Mm -hmm. And so from prevention, one way to prevent overdoses is, of course, to prevent people from getting exposed to opioids in the first place. And that involves working with the medical community to prescribe opioids very, very carefully and judiciously. The term that I like to use for that is opioid stewardship. Mm. Opioid stewardship. The parallel is to antibiotic stewardship. Right. So you might know that, uh, of course you know, but others might know that, that, um, th that we have um, antibiotic and antimicrobial resistance to antibiotics. Um, and that is due to the overuse of antibiotics in medicine but then also in areas such as agriculture, which has overused antibiotics as, as well. And so many bacteria have become resistant. And so there have been antibiotic stewardship programs in all hospitals to work with physicians and other prescribers to prescribe antibiotics carefully and judiciously. Well, it's the same parallel. Opioids are essential medications. And if you're in the emergency department with a car accident right now, <clears throat> with a fracture, you'll be getting an opioid. And if you had surgery, major surgery this morning, then you'll probably be getting an opioid. And tragically, if you have chronic pain due to cancer or palliative care, end of life, you might be getting an opioid. But you know, opioids have been way overprescribed, and the history of that has very well been very well described now. And there's even a new movie about it on Hulu. And um, and it um, and so we have to work with the medical community to prescribe opioids very carefully and judiciously. And to that end, the CDC is working on a new set of opioid prescribing guidelines, which go, which uh, build upon and go further than the guidelines that were published in 2016. And we have many other ways to work on educating the medical community on the proper prescription of opioids. The second, in addition to prevention, is working in school prevention efforts and SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse, um, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Association, works on um, uh, uh, works on school-based prevention as well as community-based prevention efforts. And we did a lot of that in collaboration with the federal government and funded by the federal government in Pennsylvania. The second is harm reduction. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of harm reduction very broadly. So that includes uh, the medication naloxone or Narcan, which is an antidote to opioid overdoses. And we have worked, um, I worked in Pennsylvania, we worked throughout the country to make naloxone extremely available. We want really everyone to be a first responder and have the lock zone in your pocket or in your car or in your purse so that you can reverse an overdose. And certainly for first responders to use the lock zone. It's a nasal form, it's, it's not that expensive and it's easily available. Um, and in many states, including what I did in Pennsylvania is that I wrote a standing order prescription for everybody in Pennsylvania to get naloxone based upon my prescription as the Secretary of Health. Now I can't do that federally, it has to be state by state, but many states have that, including Massachusetts. Um, the second part of harm reduction we're, we're advocating is fentanyl strips. So as I said, fentanyl can be in almost anything. In fact, um, the DEA has put out a, a recent advisory about little blue pills that, you, that you, people might buy on the street that you might think is Oxycontin, but actually it's pure fentanyl. Or you might buy a pill you think is Xanax, you know, off the street, um, or even Adderall off the street, but actually it contains fentanyl and can lead to an overdose and death, one pill. And so uh, we want people can have fentanyl strips 
available so that yeah, you, can, you can actually test a little scraping of that pill or a little powder to see if there's fentanyl in it so you can make the right decision and not take that. Um, and then harm reduction also means syringe service programs, uh, which we strongly advocate for to prevent disease associated with heroin and other IV drug use, but also to be able to serve as, as focal points to, uh, for distribution of naloxone and fentanyl strips, but also to connect people into treatment. Um, the third priority or the third domain is getting people into treatment. And for opioid use disorder, the standard of care is medication for opioid use disorder. And there are three medications, methadone, um, buprenorphine medications, and something called long-acting naltrexone, which is a, an injection. Uh, and we've been particularly working to increase distribution of buprenorphine type medications, which is very evidence-based and has been shown to be the standard of care uh, to, to help people um, uh, to, to overcome and, and to, you know, to treat the disease of addiction um, uh, with these medications, the disease addiction to opioids. Now, if you're addicted to methamphetamine, there, there are no standards of care for medication for that, but there are other types of treatments called contingency treatments and others that are being studied for other types of addiction. And then finally, to get people into recovery, that final step with treatment into recovery from the disease of addiction. So we're working on all aspects of that across the Department of Health and Human Services and collaborating with other um, agencies and departments as well. What a, what a uh, robust response to such a complex problem. Um, just with respect to NAT, that's medication assisted treatment mm -hmm. opioid use disorder. Um, are, are you working with the, the um, Department of Justice? I was recently talking to someone who works in corrections and they said, you know, the, the jails have really come, become the mental health centers of last resort. And I was just wondering if you were coordinating any efforts there or if DHS had, had thoughts about um, the policies around that. So we do. Um, and in Pennsylvania, we work very closely with the Department of Corrections um, uh, in, for, for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so you are correct. I mean, un unfortunately too many crimes are associated with the disease of addiction. And so people need treatment for their disease as they would for any other medical condition while they're incarcerated. And so we're strongly advocating um, uh, various types of treatment, including medication assisted treatment or medication for opioid use disorder to be available while people are in incarcerated. Um, so that when they, are, when they are released, they don't go um, immediately back to to use, which, and since if they've been away from it for a period of time, can lead to overdose and death. Um, and so we need to get, make sure that people, first is that if there are alternatives to incarceration, uh, mm -hmm. to, to try to use those alternatives, we're strongly in favor of drug courts, and there are a number of different models for drug courts. Um, and then, um, so we don't want to, to, to incarcerate someone if primarily what they're suffering from is the disease of addiction and they have a nonviolent crime. There are other alternatives to incarcerating that person. You can get them into treatment and into a drug court so they can be monitored as an outpatient and you can avoid the incarceration in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but if the incarceration is absolutely necessary, then you wanna make sure the P person is treated for their opiate use disorder while they're incarcerated and that they have the ability to get treatment when they're released. Mm -hmm. One of the key parts of that is making sure the patients have access to Medicaid when they're released is that you, you, you do not have Medicaid while you're incarcerated. That's actually federal law. And so if it takes a month to get your insurance when you're released from prison, that's a month where you have no treatment. And then people relapse, they go back to the street and they, uh, they're at great risk of overdosing and dying. So we need to look at all aspects of that and to make sure they have insurance and to make sure they have a linkage to care right when they're released from in incarceration. So we need to work hand in hand with the Department of Justice, both federally, but a lot of that is through the states and the counties as well, is that, you know, the, 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 of course, you know, three or more different systems of incarceration is the federal system, but much bigger is the state system. And then even bigger than that is the county system where people come and go on a regular basis. And so we need to work at all different levels about treatment for the disease of addiction. Thank you so much for that uh, very complete answer. Um, so part of the opioid epidemic is obviously 
the supply and synthetic fentanyl um, in part is on the demand side, which is coming from this increase, as you alluded to, in loneliness. Um, and, and obviously mental health challenges in the news, particularly for adolescents. Um, I was just wondering what you thought were the key drivers of poor mental health among youth and what you thought were the most promising scalable interventions. Well, we are, you're correct. I mean, we are certainly seeing actually an increase in mental health across the lifespan. I mean, so yeah. mental health issues in children, in teens, in adults, and in seniors. Uh, but, uh, at, at, you know, you talked about adolescents. So my field is pediatrics and adolescent medicine. So, you know, uh, when I was in academic medicine at Penn State for 20 years, um, I, I, that's what I did, is I saw troubled teens and started a number of different programs to, to, to treat them, particularly that intersection between uh, medical and physical health issues and behavioral and mental health issues. And for me, that, that involved treating patients with eating disorders. But, you know, there, there are many different drivers of, of mental health issues. Um, and a lot of it is due to isolation and loneliness and despair. And the pandemic has, has exacerbated all of those different things. You know, um, uh, young people last year, most were trying to do school remotely. They had much less access to, the, to their friends than their peers. And so we have seen an increase in mental health issues. We have seen an increase in depression and anxiety. We've seen an increase in eating disorders, such as anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Uh, we had seen an increase in terms of suicide attempts, so that's just starting to, to, to decrease and so uh, in, in adolescence. And so we, we need to approach this very holistically. We need to look at those drivers um, of, of that, and we need to be able to, to work to assess those teens uh, and to get them treatment. And we need to do that in a number of different settings. We need to do that uh, within the community, such as community health centers, federally qualified community health centers, uh, but we want to work to integrate mental health evaluation and treatment into primary care. And mm -hmm. uh, we had worked, to, I have worked to do that uh, in my academic medicine career, as well as in Pennsylvania, and now nationally, trying to integrate uh, mental health professionals into primary care settings, whether that's pediatrician settings or, fam or family medicine settings or community health centers, et cetera, for that, make it much more easy for that evaluation and treatment. The other thing which is serving us uh, and, and can be helpful is telehealth. So, you know, one of the probably the only silver linings I can think of from the pandemic is that we have used telehealth much more successfully than we have in the past. And that includes tele-mental health. And we have made a number of different rule and regulation changes across health and human services. And we are working to sustain those even as we work through and past the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, um, uh, so using telement and mental health in a number of different ways can be, uh, can be very, very successful. Um, one way is through a, a hub and spokes model called Project ECHO. Project ECHO was first designed in New Mexico where you would have, an, um, for example, the University of New Mexico, um, uh, and it might be specialists in kidney disease or it might be specialists in mental health and adolescent mental health that work with primary care providers across New Mexico. Well, that has been expanded across the country and across the world as uh, Dr. Aurora's uh, program, Project ECHO. And so I would highly recommend people to take a look at that. It's a very innovative and successful program. We had in Pennsylvania had used Project ECHO um, at Penn State uh, when I was the Secretary of Health at Penn State and we facilitated that, uh, that, that connection. Um, now, there is a social, you know, a social health equity issue on this because to do telemental health, you have to have those, you know, these little, these, these little devices so you can do that or computers. And then you have to have access to, to, to broadband. You have right. to be, so if you don't have a phone or a computer or you don't have access to, to, you know, to the internet, then you're not gonna be able to do uh, telehealth. So um, you have to make sure that either in rural areas and urban areas and other areas that you have access to those services. Is there is there much evidence on the the chatting the 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 sort of um, using chat features or even bots for? So um, there is some, but but not that much. I mean, so there's okay. evidence in terms of face to face communications, like you know this webinar, uh, and using platforms such as Zoom and other platforms. There is evidence even using audio only 
te uh, telehealth, um, but not so much just with chats, although that is being studied, mm -hmm. but um, the, the evidence is not, is not so great yet. One thing that has been shown to be very useful, uh, particularly with teens, um, are suicide hotlines that involve texting. Mm -hmm. In that we tend to think of suicide hotlines as being a phone call, but if you know teenagers now, they don't tell, they don't, they never use the telephone. They don't, they don't call anyone that if they're not, if they're not zooming or using um, FaceTime or something like that, then they're chatting or texting. And so using chat or text for suicide hotlines is absolutely necessary. If you're going to, to make those services available to teenagers. And just because I know, I mean, we've been talking about using all of these, um, these different devices for treating mental health conditions. Could you perhaps just give us your thoughts on, on the role of, of, you know, if any of social media and kind of amplifying some of the concerns? Well, so, you know, social media is a tool and social media can be used um, to, to keep people connected. And it, however, it can also be used to spread misinformation. Um, and it can be used um, uh, because it tends to, um, uh, to, to, to accelerate your exposure to one message, um, right. it can be used for harm. And so I don't think it's inherently good or bad. I think it's how it's used and how it's regulated and, and how it can be modified. Um, the Surgeon General, um, Vice Admiral Murthy, has um, spoken a lot and has a number of different, um, different publications about concerns about the media and specifically social media in terms of misinformation about COVID-19 and particularly about vaccinations, that it can, it can serve to amplify um, misinformation, disinformation and negative messages, um, uh, which can lead to more vaccine hesitancy, which is extremely dangerous given our, our current environment. There is also evidence that, that Instagram and, uh, and those platforms um, can, can be used for harm of, uh, for body image issues. Again, I used to treat patients with eating disorders and mm -hmm. that young women, if, if those body image um, uh, messages and images are amplified and amplified, they compare their bodies to, to, to you know, unattainable um, images. And then that can lead to more depression and anxiety as well as to more anorexia and bulimia. It used to be, you know, magazines that they would buy at the stand, but young people don't buy magazines at the stand anymore. It's all on the internet. And much of it is through Instagram and other social media platforms. So they're not inherently good or evil, but they need to be, they need to be used correctly. Um, mm -hmm. And parents need to monitor their teenagers social media use and their internet use. I know that that's really hard, um, but um, it's really absolutely necessary for parents to do that for teenagers. Perfect, thank you so much. Well, um, as your virtual presence means so much to so many in our HKS community. Um, could you speak to challenges faced by the LGBTQ plus community, particularly the youth, and what your view is on the set of key wraparound services, best practices, and or policies that would improve the health and well-being of LGBTQ plus individuals? Mm -hmm. So I am absolutely working to advocate for and support the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and, you know, I, uh, people have asked about sort of why I'm doing that. Well, obviously, I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community, but more, also more than that is that it's part of my health equity work. Mm -hmm. um, is that we want to work to support uh, vulnerable communities, and that includes um, sexual and gender minorities. Um, you know, I think that right now um, it's a challenging time, but also an exciting time for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I hope that, that my appointment symbolizes uh, progress. Um, as Vice Pres President Harris has said, I recognize I may be the first. Uh, but I am heartened by the sincere knowledge that I will not be the last transgender person to be nominated and confirmed uh, by, by the Senate. Uh, the administration is working to advance equity and health equity um, ac you know, across the spectrum, but including LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, I mentioned the health uh, disparities task, uh, uh, task force, and, and, and we have a specific um, arm of that uh, for LGBTQ plus health equity. There are also work uh, through the Gender Policy Council across the administration um, on, on these issues. 
Um, and in health and human services, you know, each, each division is looking at that. So um, one division is our Office of, of Civil Rights. And the Office of Civil Rights um, has come out with an interpretation uh, in the spring that the Affordable Care Act, um, uh, uh, when it says that you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex in the Affordable Care Act, that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that includes that you cannot discriminate uh, against LGBTQ plus people, um, period. And so that has been actually put into, uh, into effect in Colorado today. So the, um, the, uh, the Biden-Harris administration um, greenlit coverage of LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus care as an essential health benefit in Colorado with new benchmarks expanding access to care for transgender patients, transgender medical care. The CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, for the first time approved a request to provide gender-affirming care in the individual and small group health insurance markets as part of Colorado's essential health benefit benchmark. So that is really a landmark step. We're hoping that other states will follow. I'm looking at Massachusetts um, <laughs> and that other progressive states will, will follow. You know, um, we know that there is significant discrimination against LGBTQ plus individuals in healthcare. And that fear of the discrimination can lead to individuals to forego care. And so, you know, we feel that everyone should be able to access healthcare free from discrimination, free from interference, period. Now, you know, it's amazing that we have a president that, that champions us. President Biden champions full equality and civil rights protections for LGBTQ plus people. Um, and he is committed to advancing, to, uh, to advancing the state and federal efforts to allow LGBTQ plus people to, to, to have full access to medical care and really full access to their, to their civil rights. Uh, and he has stated this publicly a number of times, including um, specifically when he spoke before Congress. So, you know, we have a president who sees us and who advocates for us. I mean, he has said that he has our back. Um, and I want to reiterate that for LGBTQ plus people that I have their back. Now, yeah, we, we've made progress, a lot of challenges, especially from the previous administration. But we haven't made true progress unless we've made progress for everyone. And there are vulnerable communities in the, in the broader LGBTQ plus community. That includes uh, LGBTQ plus youth, um, LGBTQ plus seniors, LGBTQ plus immigrants, and particularly LGBTQ plus individuals of color. Um, and, you know, transgender women of color are, are at great risk, not just of harassment or discrimination and bullying, but at risk for violence and murder. So we have to advocate for all of our, uh, for all of our communities and the most vulnerable within our community. And that's what we're going to do at HHS and across the administration. It's uh, so inspirational, Dr. Levine. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you. And after that, we can sure. open the floor. So um, audience, this is, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand feature in Zoom and IOP staff will let you know your place in the queue. In addition, IOP staff have asked that the questioners identify themselves and their Harvard affiliation and ask one brief question. This is important that ends with a question mark. <laughs> So, uh, so this is a question we're asking all of our IRP speakers this semester, um, Dr. Levine, which is, uh, what is the greatest challenge facing our democracy today? So, you know, there are a number of different ways to answer that question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna view it with a health equity lens. And I think that the, the biggest, and you used to say existential threat to our nation and the world was climate change. But unfortunately, it is no longer existential. It is right now. You can see the impacts of climate change in our country and across the world right now with you know, um, severe heat problems in the Southwest, with severe heat problems in the Northwest, you know, um, severe 100 plus degree temperatures in Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington. <clears throat> um, uh, we can see that with, you know, massive hurricanes that have impacted our nation with flooding from Louisiana through Tennessee to New Jersey and New York City. 
Um, we can see that in terms of rising sea levels across, um, you know, that impact our, our coasts, but, uh, you know, certainly across the world. We can see that with fires that have, uh, that, that have uh, burned throughout much of uh, the Western United States, but other countries as well. And this is not only a health issue, it's a health equity issue, because although all communities are impacted, vulnerable communities are more disproportionately impacted. So if you don't have air conditioning and it's 110 degrees, you're gonna be much more impacted than if you have a great air conditioning system. If you don't have clean potable water, if you don't have, you know, if you have, are on the coast and you can't, you don't have the ability to move out of the way of a hurricane or sea level rise. So I think the greatest that threat to our democracy, to our nation and to our world is climate change. Uh, to that end, the president has a robust climate change agenda in health and human services. We have uh, opened a new office about a month ago for climate change and health equity, the Office of Climate wow. Change and Health Equity under my office to look at these issues. That's <coughs> and I'm that's losing my voice. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I can't wait to rewatch this recording and write all my own notes down. Uh, that, that's that's fantastic to hear. Um, so our first question is going to come from Hannah in the college. Hannah, do you wanna join us and ask your question? Hmm. <clears throat> Should we go to, um, okay. Hannah might be having a little bit of technical difficulty. So I'll go ahead and ask a question while we're trying to, to bring Hannah, sure. which is just about, um, as you mentioned before, the role of social media and misinformation, disinformation on, on vaccination. And we're still as, as a nation, not, you know, not fully vaccinated in the sense that not everyone has, avail themselves of the opportunity to, to become vaccinated yet, who's eligible. Can you speak to what you think are the fundamental issues that are, are leading people still to sort of doubt the technology, doubt the science and, and, and where, you know, all of us could potentially make a difference and certainly the role of HHS as well? Well, you're entirely correct. Really, um, you know, the most potent weapon that we have against COVID-19 are, are safe and effective vaccines. And so there are other tools in the public health toolbox, such as testing and contact tracing with isolation and quarantine, mitigation with masks and social distancing, but our most potent tool are our safe and effective vaccines. Um, but we are really combating uh, that misinformation uh, in terms of vaccine hesitancy. I, I think the contributing factors include the unfortunate politicalization of the COVID-19 epidemic and the and pandemic and, and the public health response. All of the measures that I talked about are public health measures. They are, not, they are not political in any way. And they have nothing to do with politics. They have to do with the toolbox that we have for public health uh, and medical treatment uh, with this you know, pandemic, uh, the size and scope that we have not seen in 102 years. And so the politicalization I think has really set our country back. And we need to work through and past that politicalization of the COVID-19 pandemic. At the same time, uh, the, the misinformation and disinformation campaigns that we are seeing um, also uh, significantly limit our, our impact. And I think that it has sown distrust of our public health and medical measures and distrust of science um, it, itself uh, and the scientific method. And I think that that makes it extremely challenging. So we're going to work across the administration on all of those. We need to work with our trusted messengers and uh, it's uh, called the, the COVID-19 Community Corps because just listening to me as a federal public health um, uh, you know, messenger is, not, is maybe helpful but necessary, but it's not sufficient. So people often will trust their, their local messengers, their local um, members of their own community, their, the, the pediatricians, the family physicians, in their community, the, the doctors in the hospitals in their community, the faith leaders in their community, 
other business leaders in their community to really educational members of their community to really talk about the, the, the safety of our vaccines, the effectiveness of vaccines and the importance of these vaccines. Um, and so I'm a positive and optimistic person. I think we're going to continue to work through this, but it's an ongoing effort. That's great. And, and actually just in some of my research, we've, we've used physicians and it's been, it's been incredibly effective. Um, but for some people who have very little experience um, with vaccination whatsoever, we actually found that uh, lay people um, worked extremely well attesting. Um, so maybe something that the we, need, we all we need to everyone to do that. We need everyone on this call to do that, to talk to your, your family, to your neighbors, to your community about the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccines, because that's who the, the trusted messengers are going to be, not just me sitting on a webinar or on TV. That's great. And I think it's a concrete thing we can all do. Um, okay, perfect. I believe Ryan at the college is up uh, next. If all righty. Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Dr. Levine, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we've been talking this evening a lot about this idea of, you know, uh, health equity. And uh, in particularly with COVID-19, uh, I know that, uh, you know, different uh, federal departments of health have really kind of had a shift in role, especially towards a little more PR, uh, you know, getting the right information out there, combating misinformation. Uh, this past week, uh, Comedian John Oliver did a piece on uh, misinformation, particularly vaccine misinformation uh, among uh, diaspora communities and, and people who, uh, you know, uh, who uh, are of different ethnic mm -hmm. backgrounds and are kind of in uh, different vacuums of information. Uh, how how do you uh, uh, how do you uh, in your department really kind of focus on, on getting and breaking those barriers uh, to reach out to those people and uh, as a, as a follow up to that, uh, how do you think the United States can use its role as you know a world leader uh, to kind of break down those barriers in other countries where uh, you know vaccine skepticism is being pushed uh, mm -hmm. by by leaders? Because at the end of the day, uh, as long as COVID nineteen is still out there, uh, you know different variants are going to come uh, come back to haunt us. So you're entirely correct. So. You know, again, we have the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. So we have a specific task force with, with primarily members of the community from throughout the country. Um, we do have some government ex officio members of which I am one, and there'll be a specific set of recommendations that will be given to the president at the end of the month. But uh, just some of the uh, you know, uh, highlights uh, from what we've discussed in, in that committee is, I mean, we, we have to, first of all, you have to do it in their own language. Right. I mean, so just doing it in English and expecting that everyone's going to understand is not going to be successful. So you're going to have to talk to people in their own language. You're going to have to do it in a culturally appropriate, culturally competent way, uh, because it's going to be different for different cultural communities, um, uh, especially in terms of, of immigrant groups and refugee groups. Um, and we're going to need to work with their local leaders in order to do that. Again, they're going to trust the, the leaders in their community more than they're going to, to trust someone from Washington or even someone from the, the state government. Uh, and then we need to provide all of the access to those resources. We have to make sure that vaccinations get to places where those people can go receive the vaccines. And so uh, that includes urban areas and, and rural areas. So I'll give you an example. We worked with um, Dr. Stanford, Dr. Stanford is a physician in Philadelphia who runs the uh, COVID-19 um, Black Physicians Coalition. Um, and she's a pediatric surgeon uh, from, the, from the community, uh, um, but she has really taken upon herself uh, to lead in terms of testing efforts and now vaccination efforts for the African-American community in Philadelphia. Um, and so I got, I got a chance um, a number of months ago to visit one of her clinics um, uh, you know, uh, which was at, uh, at Temple, right in the middle of North Philadelphia, uh, where they had a very active clinic for vaccination. But she didn't stop there. What she was doing is sending people door to door, door to door in North Philadelphia to get to come to people, um, not to pressure them, but to talk with them about the vaccines, to, to encourage the vaccines, and then to give the vaccines if people would accept them. 
um, and again, using trusted community members. So that model I always thought was a standard of what you have to do. You need to bring the, 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 the uh, you have to have you know, big vaccination sites, but sometimes you need to go door to door and to offer vaccinations to people where they are. Um, internationally, I think that we need to advocate. First, we need to continue uh, President Biden administration's efforts to distribute uh, vaccinations across the world. And uh, we are doing that. Um, millions and millions of doses that, that, have been, um, that have been given to other countries, and we will continue to do that. And then we need to continue to work with the companies to be able to work with those countries to make the vaccines in those countries. And I know that I believe Moderna is gonna be working, uh, I don't remember which country in Africa, but it's gonna be working to produce vaccines in Africa. Um, and we need to work with those countries, again, in a culturally competent way to get past um, you know, those, those barriers to people getting those vaccines. That's terrific to hear. That was, that was um, one of the questions that I, um, I was going to ask as well. So thank you so much for touching on the global vaccine equity and thank you, Ryan, for your question. Um, let's move to Sarah from the college. Hi, thank you, Dr. Levine, so much for speaking. Sure. This has been really wonderful. Um, kind of segueing off of Ryan's question, I'm curious, you're in a very unique position, obviously, health during COVID at the state and federal levels, um, and kind of seeing the emergency response from both perspectives. I'd be interested kind of to hear a little bit more about how like structurally it works, liaising with like FEMA and other emergency providers. Mm -hmm and kind of from the different vantage points. Sure, so it's critically important that local, state, and federal public health authorities work together. Because if we're not collaborating and, and communicating, then we're going to be much less, much less successful. And so we are working in the, in the administration uh, to, to collaborate with our state and local health department partners. So I'm on a call with um, uh, Dr. Chakir from the White House um, every week with a group of state and local um, public health official members, uh, as well as the, uh, the Epidemiological Association, the Laboratory Association, working through uh, the challenges that state and local health departments are having implementing plans to address COVID-19. In addition, I have a monthly phone call with ASTO. ASTO is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. And I have regular phone calls with NACHO and big cities, which are the local public health officials, because they all have different challenges. Um, the next is, is appropriate funding. And there has been robust funding uh, from the federal government to state and local health officials um, that over the course of the, of the pandemic, um, we, we need to understand sort of, sort of how state and local governments work. Um, so one thing that I have articulated to my, my, my colleagues in the federal government is that they have a, the, the states have a great difficulty spending a very large amount of money that comes right all in one pot that has an a expiration date because it creates what's called a fiscal cliff, meaning we could hire you know, 200 people, but then in a year from now, I don't have money for them. I mean, so, I mean, what do you want me to find me to fire all those people? So, you know, you need to develop ways to find, to have robust funding, but to have robust, sustainable funding um, that will be able to continue so that if I, if, as a state health official, I started programs and I hired people that I could continue those people. Um, and then we need to understand the challenges that state and local health departments have. Um, you know, they all have unique challenges. Uh, the challenges that you might have in Massachusetts are different than the challenges that the state health official is facing in Alabama, uh, in Mississippi, and in Tennessee in terms of vaccine efforts and in terms of mitigation, such as masks, et cetera. You've seen that play out in, in the media. That gets back to the politicalization uh, of the response, which we're really trying to work, to work past and to just view things from a scientific perspective. The one thing that people need to realize is, is that the science does change and people get frustrated with that, but we have learned so much about COVID-19 in the last year and three quarters that we didn't know. This was a novel new coronavirus. And so, you know, there were statements that were made that were our best estimates in, in March of 2020 
which now in October of 2021, we wouldn't say that, but we didn't know it at that time. We've learned so much as we go by. So, you know, that's how the scientific method works, whether it's science in the chemistry laboratory or the science of public health, we learn as we go and we have to be able to adapt to what the data tells us. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your question. And um, I, think, I think you are you know, motivating this whole new generation of public health scholars, Dr. Levine. That's how I, I can't see all the faces, but that's what I envision is happening over Zoom right now. Um, third, and probably our final question will be for Robert from the college. Robert? Oh, actually, Robert, yes. Robert, can you provide your question? Great. Thank Hello. You. Um, my Hi. name is Robert. I'm a first year at the college, and thank you so much, Dr. Levine, for being here. This is a really great opportunity to hear from you. Um, I know you touched a little bit already on social media, and given the recent news on Facebook and Instagram's effects on the mental health uh, of particularly teens, um, as well as the whistleblower's claims about the company's inaction in the face of their own reports on this um, mental health effect. What regulations do you believe should be put in place to try to mitigate these effects? That's a complicated question. First, uh, I, I, uh, first year at Harvard, a, a fantastic year. I was where we were uh, in Wigglesworth A in 1975. So it was a little while ago, but it's still, Wigglesworth A hasn't changed a bit, I don't think. Um, so, um, you know, I think that, that it's a real challenge, you know, and I'm not going to be able to comment on the specific regulations that are necessary. I mean, I think that, that in a perfect world, the industry would regulate itself. I, I don't see that we're seeing that to, to, to a great enough extent. Because again, it's an echo chamber. I mean, the, the, the algorithms that they use create an echo chamber so that if somebody um, you know, says that they're interested and they, they click on something that has to do with vaccine hesitancy or misinformation, that, that, then they get more and more stories about vaccine misinformation. And then they're in an echo chamber and all they're getting is more stories about vaccine misinformation. Um, and it doesn't give them a broad perspective. So I think that the companies um, uh, need to do far more to address that issue. And, you know, if necessary, then I think the, the Congress should act. Um, the, the, the Surgeon General has written about this, and he has a number of different monographs about, uh, you know, possible ways that the industry could, could regulate itself and monitor itself, or ways that it might need to be done through Congress. Thank you, Robert, um, for that excellent question from a first year, of course. Um, so I think that is all we have time for today. I, I again, I have learned so much from, from you speaking, and I I can't wait to go back and, and write down all these notes. And I think you're so inspirational on uh, so many dimensions. And I, I, I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more interest from students at the college and students at the Kennedy School to go into public health and, and public service uh, based on, based on the, the vitality that you bring to your position and, and all of the good work that you've been able to do and continue to do. Let me now um, hand it over to uh, Mark, the IOP director. Garen, would you like to come and join us? Thank you again so much, Dr. Levine. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Dr. Levine, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Professor, uh, as well, uh, for your very thoughtful moderation here. Um, Dr. Levine, from Wigglesworth A to Assistant Secretary <laughs> of Health, you have uh, led a life of consequence and bring great uh, pride and credit to your alma mater. Um, Professor Allison, as do you, and we celebrate your recent MacArthur Fellowship. So this yes, has been yes. a, a wonderful opportunity for this important conversation during this important month. And I thank Kevin Ballin for kicking, up, kicking us off so, so beautifully as our very able vice president here at the Institute of Politics. So we thank you both. This is a thoughtful conversation, great student questions. I quite agree with the, with the um, sophistication of the questions and the thoughtfulness of your responses for which we're grateful. We invite listeners back to the forum this Thursday at six o'clock, where we have a very engaging uh, panel to, with its topic of the forum, uh, re reckoning with the past and rebuilding the future. This is an effort with the Institute of Politics in collaboration with our colleagues at the Institutional Anti-Racism Accountability Project at the Ash Center. 
more welcome panelists, Dr. Ibrahim Kendi, of course, directs Boston University's uh, Center for Anti-Racist Research, as well as Heather McGee, the noted author and commentator, nonprofit leader. They will be in conversation with uh, Dr. Uh, Khalil Gibran Muhammad from the Kennedy School, who is, of course, the Ford Foundation Professor of History and Race and Public Policy here at the Kennedy School, talking about racial equity and uh, roles that we all must play to dismantle institutional racism. Next week on Thursday at six o'clock, as the midterms loom in 2022, uh, talking about the issues of disinformation and misinformation, we'll welcome Chris Krebs, who of course was the former director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, in conversation with Dr. Joan Donovan, who's the research director here at the Shore Institute Center. So our website has all information on upcoming events. Our archived forums are on our IOP YouTube channel and of course all our social media channels. So I end with my most sincere thanks to Dr. Levine for, for joining us uh, virtually. We look forward to welcoming you back to Harvard personally in person at some point during your tenure. Uh, certainly and to Professor Allison, thank you most sincerely for the thoughtfulness and the preparation you put into this conversation. Good night. <laughs>